they're about selecting and breeding honeybees for varroa tolerance and viral resistance. And we're going to begin by talking about the old-fashioned way of doing things with phenotypic selection. If there's time left at the end of the presentation, I'll go into genomic approaches that are now available for finding honeybees that are resistant to viruses and tolerant to the role by using markers that have been identified in the honeybee genome. But to begin with, we're going to talk about doing it the old-fashioned way, because that's the way that I started doing it in about 1992. So, um, I apologize in advance, some of these slides are going to be fairly dense, and there is text embedded in it. I'll try to cut through the text and give you the highlights, and if anybody has questions, we'll um, have an answer them at the end of the presentation, or if it's really confusing, you may have interrupt. So obviously, varroa mites are the first thing um, that we're going to talk about, and uh, then we'll move on to viruses. You can see a varroa mite with the thorax of the sunbeam. We were, unfortunately, one of the first Texas operations to become infested with varroa mites in 1989. We, as had been our habit, um, moved about 3,000 colonies to North Dakota. And unbeknownst to us, there was an unauthorized, unpermitted Florida beekeeper that moved in about 1,000 colonies right on top of us, right after varroa mites had happened to Florida. And that summer, um, many of our colonies in North Dakota were found to be infested with varroa mites. I'm uh, proud to say that I reported that to the North Dakota Department of Agriculture. I'm not proud of what Paul Jackson did to me after that. He made me depopulate those hives in North Dakota, and I had to kill them off. Um, that was a fairly devastating economic blow, even though I managed thousands and thousands of colonies. It's not easy to tolerate that kind of mentality. But, um, we began to treat um, our honeybees with the carousides immediately because otherwise they were going to die and they did die in spite of being treated something because we waited too long. In those early days no one was sure exactly how to do it, what to look for, how to, how to measure the run the station levels accurately. And uh, that's still tricky because the station levels can change overnight. Uh, I became very disillusioned with the practice of introducing toxins into honeybee hives to control parasites. And having had some experience with genetics and selecting bees for genetic traits that were heritable that would confer resistance to other mites and other pathogens, I decided to, well, why not try selecting bees that are resistant to varroa mites? Well, how are you going to do that? First of all, you've got to identify heritable traits, and then you've got to figure out how, what it is you're going to select for. What is, what is your signal of varroa resistance going to be? And unlike many of the other people who embarked in the 1990s on selecting for varroa resistance, I decided not to use some intermediate proxy of resistance. Okay? In other words, don't look for infestation levels in colonies. Don't look for my population growth. Don't look for any other measure except does the colony survive varroa mite infestation when not treated? Okay, so I look for direct survival in the face of varroa infestation is my selection criteria. Well, guess what? That was an ambitious goal. There were plenty of scientists in Europe who laughed me out of the room when I spoke uh, in an international conference in the mid-1990s telling them what I was trying to do. And uh, one famous German entomologist said, well, you know, what you're, what you're up to is trying to select bees that are resistant to varroa mites. Let me give you an analogy of how, how impossible that's going to be. Not just difficult, but impossible. He said, this would be like trying to select sheep that are resistant to wolves. It can't be done. Um, we, on the other hand, my father and I, had reasons for optimism because we had been involved in a Acarapus wood eye resistance breeding project for many, many years. And as many of you probably are aware, Brother Adam began breeding bees for tolerance to Akron mites in the early part of the 20th century using survivor colonies from the Isle of Wright disease that had decimated English populations of honeybees. And we had collaborated with 
brother at him, beginning in the mid 60s, right about the time that I was getting into the VR and getting up on Saturday mornings and going out to pitch wings with my dad, well, we began raising buckshot stories. And we had produced a line of bees that when Acker and Mike reached the U.S., were able to survive and thrive despite that infestation. And um, we had gathered that not only was it a worthwhile thing to do, but it could be economically rewarding for our business if we were successful. So we were motivated by the desire to keep bees without the risk of contamination of hive matrices with pesticides and with the prospect that if we were able to select and breed bees that were tolerant of rural mites, it might provide an economic boost and our queens might be worth more. So, um, motivated by those things, um, we hoped that we would still be in business by the time we found success if we did so. And that was not at all clear in the early days. Um, because, let me skip through now and move um, on to the, the troubles at hand. And again, we're, we're selecting a colony phenotype. So you don't measure what any individual bee is doing, you're selecting for the colony's fitness. Well, that's complicated because as you know, honeybee queens make multiple drones. And although all bees in the hive are half sisters, um, even the super sisters, those that share a drone father, exhibit some degree of variability in their own individual colony function and phenotype. So I, you know, we decided to go ahead and do something even harder. We're going to look for colony phenotype and fitness. So how do we do it? I've already been on this. Um, but anyway, in the beginning, we had many wrong turns and dark alleys. It felt like, much like the green Carlsbad counters without flashlight. Um, so the first year of selection, we left a thousand colonies untreated. Of those, only about a hundred survived, some of them barely alive. Um, only about 50 were able to produce any surplus honey at all. And then we started trying to raise queens from those $50 and evaluate how effective the project were at resisting varroa mites. We found that we had almost no progress. Only nine of, I think it's nine, right? Five. Five of those 1,000 colonies had progeny that were measurably more tolerant than the original queen. So that's, a, that's very poor results. And it was a very expensive proposition. But we, we persisted and we lost many thousands of colonies over the next few years as we, again, left a good portion of our hives untreated every year, starting in 1992. Um, we did see a few encouraging signs. Of those uh, nine that showed phenotypic um, um, measures of some success and the five that had heritable measures of success, we did see that they were chewing infested brood, removing infested pupae, and that there was reduced presence of varroa mites in the brood. Pardon me? Um, and so we persisted, again, as I said, despite the discouragement of those early years and only incremental progress until all of a sudden um, in late 95 we had uh, significant increases in the number of colonies that had survived and had been reared by reared from those queens that were heading colonies that had exhibited significant levels of varroa tolerance and had survived without treatment and actually produced a little bit of honey or produce bees for harvesting packages and queens. And we also noticed that among the progeny of those survivor colonies, we had reduced incidence of parasitic mite syndrome. So um, about the same time, I thought that I was seeing something else that I could use as a predictor of colony fitness and colony propensity to tolerate varroa mites. And that was the incidence of deformed wing bees in the colony. And as you know, deformed wing virus is what's responsible for causing deformed wing bees, and deformed wing virus is vectored by varroa mites. So my thinking was, after determining that I was losing colonies to deformed wing virus, even though I could find very, very few varroa mites in those colonies, I decided, well, 
maybe we could get ahead faster and more efficiently if I was also requeening all my colonies that exhibited lots of deformable bees, even if I couldn't find rural mites in those colonies. And so about 95, I started doing that. And by 1999, um, or 1997, excuse me, we, um, we, um, we stopped treating nearly all our colonies and decided to just go cold turkey and see what happened. Because we were encouraged enough that we could make that make that transition by that point. Uh, but we were still suffering from reduced honey production compared to our historic production averages. We, we um, historically in our operation had been able to produce about 85 pounds, 90 pounds of honey in Texas per colony and about 100 and 35 to 175 pounds of honey and colonies moved to North Dakota or Montana. So um, we were getting lower honey production, but we were getting colonies that were still productive and survived without treatment. So we were making progress. Um, we also noticed that um, we continue to have a few other related, pro uh, unrelated problems that seem to trickle down with the level of resistance to the mites that our colonies exhibited. Principally, we saw higher frequency of um, European fowl breeding in those colonies. We also um, determined that we probably had a larger signal of Africanized introgression in our bees who were, that were highly resistant to auroral mites, at least on average, in those early years. But um, we began to also select for other, other um, we never stopped selecting for other traits, but we emphasized selection for gentleness beginning in about 98, 99. And uh, because we didn't want to lose that, that had been a low star of our breed for generations. And we also began to incorporate these red lines in order to enhance the genetic diversity that was out there, although uh, subsequent studies have revealed that our honeybees are actually more genetically diverse than other commercial breeding populations in the U.S. by far. Um, by 99, I had colonies like this that were left untreated for multiple years without a care size, and that's what we were after. We wanted to see beautiful frames full of sealed brood that once that brood emerged, those bees were productive, they didn't have deformed wings, they weren't shrunken, and they had normal lifespans. And we got there, but it remains a continuing struggle today um, because it can be tricky. You can fool yourself. You can, um, you can select colonies that you think are resistant to viruses and tolerant of rural mites, only to discover that actually what's happened is, is that you have fortuitously got, or um, maybe it's unlucky, actually, if you're involved in this kind of project, you've got colonies that escaped infestation or escaped infection with viruses. And so you've inadvertently just selected for the lucky ones, not the ones that are resistant. So you have to bear in mind that um, this sort of project is fraught with peril. You've got to be very careful every step of the way to make sure you're not fooling yourself. And um, we, uh, we constantly have to remind ourselves to be vigilant and to continue to focus on every generation finding those bees that remain highly productive, yet gentle, and also are very resistant to Robots and and um, and honey viruses too. I, I want to emphasize that last point because we uh, we do want to continue to select for bees that are tolerant of barefoot beekeeping, right? We all want, we all want to be able to do this in our backyard. You know? Wake up on Sunday morning if you want to go into your hive, you know, with your cup of coffee, just you know. You want to be able to do that, right? You don't want to have to don the full-on protective gear, particularly in the heat of Texas summers. So while you're busy selecting for one thing, you can't lose other things along the way. And that's very, very easy to do. Even if you're selecting for something as simple as increased honey production. If you're not also keeping your eye on lots of other balls at the same time, keeping them in play, you can end up losing other valuable traits that your colonies exhibit. Um, anyway. The pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is we've got honeybees, we don't have to worry about treatment, and believe me, as a commercial beekeeper, it is a huge relief and a limiter of 
of stress, not to have to worry about monitoring for worldwide populations and worrying about colonies dying if you don't get that care site into your colony at the appropriate time. And that's not to mention um, the associated problems of a care site resident accumulation in wax and other hive matrices. And don't forget that despite the fact that most of those care sites end up in wax because wax is hydrophilic, loves those organic compounds and sucks them up, there are measurable concentrations that are found in other hive products too. And if you want to have organic honey and keep honey that's as pure as possible, you don't want to be putting poisons in your hive. Um, so, now what, let's move on. Is there time still? Um, is that clock accurate? I guess it is. Um, I'll talk about in more detail some of the genomic work that I've done in collaboration with many other honeybee scientists, researchers, and, and uh, beekeepers out there across the country. Uh, some of the more notable names would be Jay Evans at the USDA ARS um, Bee Research Facility in Beltsville, Maryland. Uh, Bob Ganka and John Harbo, formerly in John's case um, at ARS Baton Rouge, that's where Bob Ganka is right now. Tom Rinberg there as well. Uh, Gene Robinson at the University of Illinois. Uh, Hugh Robertson um, at the University of Illinois. Um, Richard Maleska at um, University of Australia. Um, and I think the list goes on and on. But um, I particularly want to single out Hugh and Gene and Jay and Richard Valeska because they were my co-conspirators in getting the honeybee genome sequenced. And I'm very proud to have had a leadership role in that effort. And because of that, we now have new tools that are available that will allow us to select other honeybees for aerobic tolerance and viral resistance without having to go through this arduous process of finding colonies that exhibit a colony phenotype that confers survivorship. Um, and um, it, it would be much simpler if we could just go out there and test our bees for genomic markers that we could be assured were associated with varroa tolerance and viral resistance. So that was one of my motivating um, reasons for becoming involved in the Navy Genome Project. And over the course of time, we have been able to demonstrate that our bees um, show detectable field level signals of viral resistance. Okay, so what you're looking at here in this slide is average levels of viral titers in varroa resistant VR versus varroa susceptible colonies collected in Texas and North Dakota and Montana over the course of several years. And um, you can see that the individual viral loads in bees from those colonies is significantly different between the varroa resistant and the varroa susceptible colonies. Okay? So that's encouraging. Again, we're seeing that there's a direct measure of the presence of virus and the concentration or titer of virus in the hemolymph of these bees that are varroa susceptible versus varroa tolerant. There's more virus in the varroa susceptible than there is in the varroa resistant bees. Okay? So then the problem becomes, okay, why? Why is that happening? What's going on there? Okay, well, um, we don't have the genes labeled here so that you can pick out which are which, but trust me that what this cladogram shows is that bees that are resistant tend to have lower levels of the virus and that's what that heat map is showing over there, as well as differing levels of expression of certain genes. Okay? So, what's the take home message? The bees that are varroa resistant and virus resistant have a different gene expression pattern than the bees that are varroa susceptible and virus susceptible. Okay? So, there are reproducible differences in transcript abundance between the two lines of bees. So again, that shows you that there is there's something going on there genomically, right? The bees that are resistant are turning on and elevating the expression of certain genes, and the bees that are susceptible are expressing other genes at higher levels. And this is, um, this is a different 
tests that we've conducted. Oops, I'm not there. Um, so this is a survey that we conducted of our honeybees looking at um, about 1,500 markers scattered across the genome, seeing if we could find markers that were correlated with resistance. And we were able to find some at very, very uh, significant p values. Um, so we, we think we're coming in on single nucleotide polymorphisms of genetic variation in the honeybee that is associated with the phenotype of varroa resistance, varroa tolerance, and viral resistance. Um, and this is showing a uh, principal component analysis of the target sample set of varroa versus varroa resistant versus varroa susceptible colonies. I apologize for the resolution there, but um, you can see that there are some of the X markers that are out there far to the right and uh, distinguishable from the O markers. And this is just a complicated mathematical way of expressing the same thing that I just said. And it looks like there are signals associated, genomic signals associated with the difference between the two traits. And again, going back to what we observed before, but this time not looking, um, looking more carefully at um, formal wing virus loads, we can again see that the um, viral load level is different in the bees that are resistant versus the bees that are um, susceptible. And um, this is going back to another thing that I mentioned previously. There are specific sets of genes that are expressed at higher levels or in uh, resistant colonies and different sets of genes that are expressed at lower levels in susceptible bees. Uh, and this is encouraging because you would expect, and these are immune-related genes, I might add, uh, these, these genes express biopeptides that are natural antibiotics. Okay. So those are the, the sorts of genes that you would expect to see differentially expressed if they were responsible for the phenotype that we've been selecting for. And um, I don't think I want to go into this right now because this is a little bit hard to breathe for the uninitiated. But um, we can we can find differences between the resistant and susceptible lines, as I've said, and we can also find uh, differences in viral expression, viral load between resistance and susceptible, and we can um, look for overlaps among all those sets and reduce the number of candidates to examine more carefully that way. Now, let's, let's, let's not forget to talk a little bit about this important subject too, because um, I, for one, was extremely alarmed to hear about an NPR piece that was aired only days ago. I don't know whether any of you actually heard it live or not. I just read about it later. But apparently NPR had a piece where they were saying that um, if you're not treating your bees with chemical or kerosides to control varroa mites, then you're harming the honeybee population which I thought was um, an alarming and extraordinary thing to hear, particularly on NPR. Um, I, for one, think that's completely upside down. I think people who are attempting to rear and keep bees without use of chemical control measures are doing the honeybee population a world good. And um, it, it leads me to wonder whether this NPR writer or editor you know, have stock in Monsanto or Bayer or you know, what in the world is going on. Hmm. Because, I, you know, trust me, I, I conducted the very first experiment on toxicity of kerosides to honeybees and the effect on honeybee queen longevity and fecundity way back in the early 1990s with Marla Spivak when she was a young scientist. And we were able to demonstrate then that if you put Pimafos in your hives, it has bad consequences. It's deleterious to the colony. And in particular, it's deleterious to the reproductives. The queens are not as reproductive. They don't live as long. You get higher sleep procedure rates. There are fewer drones. Many of those drones are infertile. You know, poisons are bad news. You don't want to be putting those in your hive. You can avoid it. 
And this, um, this slide is work that comes out of Jay Evans' lab, Bessel Merrill. I don't want to find any relationship to this work. I just want to report the results. Extremely important. Imidacloprid, as you know, is one of the neonicotinoid pesticides that is enjoying widespread use across agriculture and uh, also in backyard gardens and homes. And imidacloprid is highly toxic to honeybees at extraordinarily low doses. It's about 10,000 10, times as toxic to honeybees as DDT is. Okay? And it's also got sublethal effects, which is even scarier. So it low parts per billion concentrations and metacloprid can have effects on honeybee behavior, honeybee communication, honeybee navigation. It's like your bees are stoned. They fly out of the hive and they can't figure out how to get back home. Um, so it's very, very dangerous and extraordinarily low concentrations and we have to worry about that because that pesticide is ubiquitous in the environment right now. And bees do return to the colony, even in areas that are not agricultural, with detectable levels of this pesticide. It's very harmful to bees. As you can see here, it has interaction effects with other pathogens that are deadly to bees. Okay? So what you're learning here from this slide is, is if you're exposed to imidacloprid, your colony is more likely to succumb to Nacina serrani. Could you explain the axis or how you that based on those parts? Okay, sure. So, um, the Nacima spores per bee? The, the, the type is hard to read. So I, I, I realize that. I'm yeah. so sorry. So, the Nacima spores per bee, okay, on the vertical axis, all right? And then you have control and low and high imidacloprid exposure levels across, okay? So, you've got dramatically lower Nacima spore counts in those bees that were not exposed to imidacloprid. Colonies that were exposed to metaclobrid, much higher than semen counts. Okay? So it doesn't have to be a direct effect of the pesticide. Pesticides can suppress immune function of bees and have other impacts on colony behavior and individual bee function that result in higher pathogen and parasite levels. That's bad news. And we firm believe that the pesticides are bad for your colony. And if you want to do what you can to keep your colony healthy, one of the things you want to do is minimize their exposure to pesticides. And that's why I think this NPR article is so, is so unbelievably upside down. It's far better for your bees and for the honeybee population in general if we breed bees that are genetically tolerant of parasites and resistant to pathogens. I'll get that off my high horse now because I think I'm almost done. Um, you can see the same thing with fibrin milk, okay? Fipronil is another common pesticide that's often used in roach control. Some beekeepers use it for controlling small hive bees in their hive. Okay? And hopefully you're not exposing your bees to fipronil because as you can see here, the same thing is going on. Um, you, you know, you're, you're, you're losing uh, bees and those that are both exposed to fipronil and infested with mesenchymal serotonin. Um, I'm going to talk about this a little bit. Uh, let's see more details. Andy, hey, real quick yeah. question for you. You spoke a lot about selection and you spoke a lot about non chemical treatments of the bees. Uh -huh. um, for the small scale hobby beekeeper who only has a few hives in their backyard that they want to keep quote unquote naturally or they catch a swarm or two. How do you recommend that they go about selecting for bromine resistance and what to do with the hives that don't make it Okay. Um, yeah, everybody should be engaged in this work. It's not just something that I should be thinking about. If you want to do it on your own, okay, um, I would encourage you to attempt to begin with a reasonably diverse genetic background in those colonies that you're keeping. If you want to start from scratch and do it yourself. Because you've got to remember that if you don't have genetic variability in your population, your ability to select for genetic material that provides a trait of interest is going to be reduced. Because in selection, whether it's natural selection and evolution and action, or whether it's accelerated natural selection that you, the beekeeper, are bringing to bear on the 
solution space. If you don't have that genetic variation in the background, it's going to be very difficult to do much, right? You don't have much to select. That's what it boils down to. So begin with a diverse population. And then as I attempted to mention in the early part of the talk, you, you've got to be careful that you're not fooling yourself, okay? So through the back to our beekeeper, and you want to score your colonies for varroa tolerance or viral resistance, you actually probably need to do some sort of controlled um, exposure treatment, right? You understand what I'm saying? So you, you know, harvest varroa mites, knock them down, not kill them, and then inoculate each colony with approximately equal numbers of mites. So you get the same infestation on the beginning. Or you can start nukes or hives from a giant package. That's the way the research is typically done on the larger scale. Get five pounds of bees or 10 pounds of bees, stir them all around to make sure that you're starting out each of your colonies with an aliquot of bees from that same original sample. It's going to have more or less the same number of royal mites in each little handful. And then, you know, introduce different queens into each of those starting rooms and then evaluate their performance at a time. Okay. I also mentioned that um, don't, be, don't be fooled by the infestation level. We've talked about that. But then you've also got to worry about the longitudinal aspect of these efforts. You've got to keep this experiment going for a significant period of time. Because I'll just mention one thing that can change your results. Experience that I had early on that led me down some blind alleys. So it turns out that some propolis that bees produce, or collect actually, from plants, of course, the propolis or propolis is plant resident, right? Sap. There are certain areas of Texas that produce propolis that has anti-varroa effects. Okay? I'm not sure exactly how it works, but I suspect that it's probably like maybe a natural parasite. But I noticed early on that if I had bees in a particular area of the Brazos River bottom, and they were bringing in lots of this propolis, they could be extremely vulnerable bees, and they'd still survive for a long period of time before I got any differential signal in survivorship between them and truly resistant colonies. And that was due just because of the due to just the presence of the propolis in the hive, helping to control the aromas. So again, you got to. You gotta make sure that you're not having your results confounded by some interaction factor like that. You probably also want to think about, okay, how am I gonna make sure that it's not actually Nosema that's killed off by colony instead of the robots? That's probably the hardest thing of all of it. And they uncap those pupae and they haul the infested pupae out of the hive. All right, I know they do that. One of the early things that I actually selected for was the presence of chewed mites, mites with noticeable, um, um, you know, they, they'd obviously been worked on by the bees lying on the bottom of the hive. So, um, and also, um, I, I think my bees are just a little bit more intolerant of intruders. I've noticed that my bees, and I, I don't claim that this is unique to my bees, but my bees, when small hive beetles are present, they're like chasing those things around the hive like crazy. You know, trying to run them into a little propolis pen that they've built in the corner or on the side of one of the frames. And other bees that I've, for instance, gotten from Florida because sometimes we have to bring in bees to fulfill demand for packages or nukes, those bees are just complacent. You know, they don't really react to small hive beetles running around inside the hive in the same way. So I, I do think that the behavioral repertoire is a big part of particularly varroa tolerance and, and suppressing varroa populations. Although for the virus resistance, I'm, I, I tend to think it's probably more related to um, transcript abundance and immune function, uh, expression level differences in genetic material. Okay? Well, you know, I, I think that we had um, 
problems with that, particularly in the early years of our selection program. I think that because we rear most of our queens in the same part of Texas and have for many, many years, that we have a, an extremely significant influence on the feral population in that area. So the feral population in that area is probably carrying a lot of the same traits that I've been selecting for over the years. Yeah, however, however, I, I want to emphasize that that was not the case in the early years. And that, you know, you got to remember that when I embarked on this project back in um, the early 90s, Africanized bees had just gotten here too, just like Varroa mites. So that was probably a hindrance in some respects, but it may have enabled me to um, have a broader, more diverse population to select upon to begin with too, okay? You just have to be careful that you don't bring along for the ride hitchhiker traits that you don't want because that's easy to do. I want to emphasize that. That's probably the trickiest part of breeding bees is to find bees that exhibit what you want and yet still retain the other characteristics that we all prize like high honey production, healthy populations, queens with reasonable longevity, gentleness, all those things are extremely important. Thank you.